Hey, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the second webinar in our Georgia Smart webinar series. I'm Greg McCormick, director of the Georgia Smart Communities Challenge. Today, we're very excited to have with us Dr. Kim Cobb and Dr. Russ Clark. They're going to be talking about their research. Just a few housekeeping activities. Please mute your audio if you have not already and mute your video. Also, we will be taking questions at the end of the presentation. You can submit your questions through the chat area and we'll read them and get those questions answered. So uh, welcome Dr. Kim Cobb. She's a professor in the School of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences at Georgia Tech and a Georgia Power Faculty Scholar. Her research is focused on oceanography, geochemistry, and paleoclimate modeling while she runs the research lab in the School of EAS in paleoclimate and climate change. She's an advanced professor in institutional diversity, part of the National Science Foundation's efforts to increase representation and advancement of women in science and engineering. She holds a PhD in oceanography from the Scripps Institute of Oceanography at the University of California in San Diego, and has a Bachelor of Science in Geology and Bio Biology from Yale. Welcome, Dr. Cobb. Oh, thanks so much. Dr. Russ Clark is also with us. He's a senior research engineer in the School of Computer Science and GT Arnock. So welcome to you too. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thanks for having us. All right. Well, we are so excited to be here today um, together, which is a special treat to sit in the same place and share the work that we've been doing uh, together here at Georgia Tech with several other colleagues, as well as uh, some community partners that we'll be discussing. So as Greg discussed, we are uh, one of the four projects that was named as part of the Georgia Smart Communities Challenge. Uh, this is a, a really novel kind of research partnership where um, people from Georgia Tech, scientists, engineers, uh, and other experts partner with community entities to uh, try to design and where possible implement and pilot some smart communities, frameworks, and technologies to serve those communities' needs. And so we're very thrilled to be partnering in this particular project with the Chatham Emergency Management Agency, as well as the City of Savannah Mayor's Office and Office of Sustainability. So I want to um, really echo our, our gratitude for those uh, community partners and all the hard work that they have done over the last six months of this project to get it to where it is today. And uh, we still have about six to seven months of this year-long project under the umbrella of Georgia Smart Communities. But I think as you'll realize, we have a lot of work to do. We're very ambitious and really we're just getting started. So that's the, the fun part about this project. So clicking on to some of the um, introductory material, if I can uh, click, Russ, I must have some kind of challenge with clicking here. That's why I have the computer science person. Great, thanks. So uh, obviously we all are aware that coastal sea level rise, coastal flooding represent a, a now term threat for the coastal communities across much of the southeastern United States. So I'm just showing here a map of our study area, which is Chatham County down on the coast. So Savannah is the city you may know of, and Chatham County is the surrounding area. And this is a map that the Chatham Emergency Management Agency put together, uh, showing the vulnerability to storm surge related to various hurricanes of Cat 1 and 2, 3, 4, and 5 obviously demonstrating the acute vulnerability of this location, even without sea level rise. Uh, this is an area that faces really acute threats from uh, the hurricane storm surge, and that's, of course, going to get worse going forward. And so as you think about the other assets that are down there that are of statewide importance, um, we also have to call uh, into the, the discussion the Port of Savannah, which is, of course, a huge economic driver, itself uh, quite vulnerable um, down there on the coast um, with upstream impacts and downstream impacts uh, far beyond that specific location. So um, the nexus of the historical areas in Savannah, the cultural heritage of these places, uh, the economic engine that represents um, the, the portion of the state's economy wrapped up in this, in this county, it's, a, it's an incredible study site for a project like this with a, a high level of need for uh, planning for resilience around uh, coastal flooding. And so we also can look down right to the south, which is Glynn County. Uh, that's a neighboring county. And as you can see from this map put forward by their emergency planning agencies, uh, you can see storm surge levels illustrating the same kind of vulnerability. So I just want to highlight that 
again, coming back to that concept that the acute vulnerability to coastal flooding is not unique to Chatham County. It's not unique to Glynn County. This is a problem that stretches up and down the eastern seaboard across much of the Gulf of Mexico, as I'm sure many of you are aware. And so the challenge here is to develop and design and pilot a uh, smart sea level sensor network and uh, in the, embedded in a framework of community co-development that we can use to inform uh, the rollout of this kind of network and this kind of framework to other uh, communities and serve those other places up and down the coast. So that's the, the long-term goal. And we're, as you can see, we're gonna share today some of the strides that we have made recently. So sea level rise is uh, nothing new to anybody. Uh, it's obviously a growing problem. I just want to start with some of the data behind this and talk a little bit about where sea level rise is going. So this is a data uh, set representing global sea level rise uh, integrated across the surface of the Earth as measured by satellites going back to 1993. And so you can see here that this is what I call one of the most boring curves in climate science. Uh, it's very clearly going up. Uh, it's, it's unclear whether it's going to always be linear, but for right now, you can draw a pretty straight line through that and understand some of the risks going forward. And indeed, that's a lower end for what we might expect. In 100 years, propagating this trend forward, you get about uh, 12 inches of sea level rise by 2100, uh, give or take. And so that's a minimum expectation for what we should be moving forward and planning around for the coastal the coastal Georgia communities as well as other East Coast communities. And so this is uh, dialing down into the local tide gauge, which is at Fort Pulaski. This is Georgia's only official NOAA tide gauge. It was installed in 1935, and it also depicts a trend that is uh, has a lot more structure to it in this case, obviously. Uh, you can see some, certainly there'll be some storm surges in there and some years of higher and lower uh, sea level. So there's a richer data set, but obviously showing us that this uh, Fort Pulaski and the Georgia coastline has not escaped this sea level rise. Um, this the trend is very similar to the global average. Um, local sea level in mean, this data set has uh, gone up 10 inches in about 85 years or so. So there's a lot of uncertainty going forward with uh, how to treat sea level rise. And so this is a graphic that illustrates some of that uncertainty arising from the climate projections and how they impact global sea level rise over the next uh, 80, 80 years or so. And so what's represented here is the long-term information from tide gauges as much as we can glean going back to 1800 and then projecting forward to 2100. And so this uh, axis is in meters now. So how to recalibrate ourselves from the millimeters and inches of the previous discussion. So uh, these numbers are, are, of course, quite significant on the low end, um, looking towards something of, about uh, maybe a quarter to a half a meter. And then on the extreme side, looking towards something two to two and a half meters. So why the big spread? Uh, there are two key sources of uncertainty going into these projections. One is the road that we choose to take with our emissions. So if we take a high end of emissions trajectories, we're going to end up on that red curve. Um, if we uh, take a lower end, we're going to be more in the blue space. And so the other uncertainty that's folded in here is the response of the large ice sheets to that warming. So of course, you can have very high levels of warming with massive ice sheet instabilities tipping you towards that red curve. You can have very high rates of warming with uh, more stable ice sheets than we've thought, keeping us more towards that middle ground. So again, uh, the spread of uncertainty here is just staggering when coastal communities look at this uh, you know, they basically go, go white. I mean, there's very little you can do to, to plan around something like this other than to start now and start to assess what are the critical infrastructures and vulnerabilities that you need to get out ahead in terms of your planning um, and how can you understand not just the global rates, but how you should expect that to come down the pike to your local community, um, in your backyard, in your peers, in your ports. And that's a big question. There's a lot even more uncertainty we would really should bake into this plot projecting down to something like Savannah. And so part of the challenge is really uh, downscaling the sea level projections going forward and understanding how they play out on the coast. So it's not just global sea level. We have to consider regional sea level expressions, as well, of course, as extreme events like hurricanes that are all too familiar here in the southeast. 
So this is some of the motivating space for, for us. How does this come down, these projections to Fort Pulaski? Here we have a scenario that plays out what that tide gauge might be registering in terms of extreme flood frequencies over the next 100 years. Um, that red space indicating um, what uh, the extreme occurrences of flooding might be like in 2100, again, corresponding to those extreme scenarios, um, kind of the top 5%, if you will, of sea level rise outcomes for this region. And so uh, obviously this is a, a growing and, and, and fairly um, uh, important problem to start planning for now um, in terms of what going to happen. And those extreme sea level scenarios, as I've said before, are up to um, 51, 60 inches of sea level rise by 2100. And I, I point you to the National Climate Assessment, which goes into some of this, as well as a NOAA technical report um, published by Sweet et al. in 2017 uh, that contains the uh, previous slide I'd showed on, on global sea level rise rates, compiling everything we know. Of course, the, the ultimate um, uh, referee for what those sea level projections are going to look like uh, in the next uh, couple of years is going to come from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that's going to wrap up an assessment of this entire space, wrapping into play warming, the ice sheet instabilities, what we know about potential feedbacks in the system, and reporting that within the next two years. And I'm, I'm honored to be part of that group working on that assessment. So. I can tell you sea level is, is one of the thorniest pieces that they're grappling with. So um, sea level rise, of course, is something that, uh, you know, is contributed to by two factors. So we talk a lot about ice sheets, and this is uh, reports coming out from the New York Times over the last couple of weeks demonstrating um, potential tipping points of ice sheet instabilities, noting that Greenland warming and melting is accelerating. Um, portions in Antarctica melting is uh, accelerating. And so uh, this reminds us that uh, the clock is ticking and there's a lot we don't know about how these ice sheets will melt. That's maybe about 50% of the sea level rise rates uh, owing to the melting of land ice. The, about the other 50% is caused by the uh, warming in the upper ocean layers that has been storing up to 90% of the heat that we've generated with our emissions has actually been absorbed into the surface ocean. And that's a, a, an amazing service <laughs> riding us out of a lot of that heat. Uh, and that has caused the surface ocean to expand. It's an, it's an uncompressible fluid. And so we have uh, sea level rise globally uh, going up because of that ocean warming as well. And so the acceleration in recent ocean warming is, uh, is also has direct implications for the continued and, and perhaps accelerations of global sea level rise in the next decades. So um, I'll, I'll let Russ talk about this photo because it's one of the photos that he took illustrating how complex flooding can be down in his neighborhood. Yeah, so the moral of the story here is we don't have to wait for a hurricane uh, to have significant events that uh, have impact on the community and that uh, obviously are changing uh, how uh, we, we can live and work uh, uh, along the coastline. Uh, this uh, was a uh, truly a, a blue sky and that, that there was no storm uh, centered over us uh, Thanksgiving weekend. Uh, there was a significant uh, uh, you know, front that had come through and, and was a, a storm out in the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, but what it did for us was happen to give us two days of steady uh, winds out of the southeast uh, uh, at, at 15, 20 miles an hour uh, or more, uh, combined with uh, a, a lunar uh, high tide cycle, uh, just a normal uh, monthly uh, uh, cycle that, that that happened to coincide, and uh, there we are. This is uh, some uh, a scene from from my neighborhood, where uh, uh, they're in Richmond Hill uh, in Bryan County, and um, uh, basically what we saw was water levels significantly higher than during uh, Hurricane Matthew. Uh, they weren't as bad as her as Irma the following year, but but uh, significantly uh, more coastal flooding in certain areas uh, than we saw in, in the hurricane two years before. Great. So uh, I think this photo just encapsulates the complexity and the 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 current threat that's posed by coastal flooding. So it can be a a wind event. It could be a a, a 
a high tide, a king tide, it can be a hurricane, it can be uh, just the, the creep of sea level on a, a daily basis, which will be lapping onto these shores uh, every day over the next decades. One more uh, uh, note relative to this picture that people can relate to is during this same time, the causeway to Tybee Island was closed. It was flooded uh, and was closed for two or three hours uh, that morning, uh, right after Thanksgiving. And completely un unanticipated, not forecasted until uh, just a few hours before, uh, when the, the evening before, when everybody realized what was happening. Yeah, so that, that's another key component of our project. Um, the how can we provide these communities with some real-time information and ideally uh, information ahead of time as to how they can translate the title condition and the weather into information about where the flooding will be most acute and how communities can respond to that threat, not as it's happening, hopefully, but um, obviously ahead of time. And so I'll speak to some of that in a minute. And so the challenge that uh, I hope we've been motivating here uh, is that this is a region that's acutely vulnerable to flooding. Uh, there are grades of flooding emergencies, but obviously we're really focused with Chatham County Emergency Management as a partner here on making sure that we go uh, through the, the worst case scenarios in our uh, ability to uh, equip them with solutions. So we're thinking about uh, what can we do to prepare these communities of information ahead of flooding emergencies, understanding that um, flooding depends on uh, inland rainfall rates, drainage, wind directions, uh, storm surge, all of these things to come together in an event like a hurricane. So uh, how can we help understand how that's playing out in real time and ideally, again, provide some forecasting ability. And then during an event, Obviously, uh, you're needing to keep up with the uh, flooding of critical infrastructure. You need to be uh, channeling resources to help uh, people, people uh, be safe and property stay uh, intact as possible for that critical infrastructure. So that's something that uh, we hope to serve, a real-time information delivery. And then afterwards, and this was an important motivating piece for the project, um, there needs to be some assessment of some of that critical infrastructure to make sure that the community can go back to business. And of course, the clock is ticking and, and you know, economic costs are piling up and that becomes extremely uh, costly to communities if they have to go out and survey like they have before um, 150 bridges because they don't know uh, which bridge was touched by seawater during that event and which bridge wasn't. And so uh, the pattern of the flooding being uh, potentially so erratic. And so this is uh, something that we, we keep our eyes on in partnering with the Chatham County Emergency Management Agency and serving them up some capacity in infrastructure and data. And so brings us to our project. So this is our website. I um, encourage you to check it out. Just have a screenshot here of the, some of the front page content. And here I get to call out uh, the, the heroes and heroines of this project who have come together repeatedly to ensure um, not just that it, it gets off the ground, but that it has been wildly successful, fun and rewarding uh, and deeply threaded through the fabric of that community and uh, keenly, keenly um, focused on serving that community. So on the Georgia Tech side, we have a pretty deep bench led by Russ and I, but also with heavy involvement by Manu Di Lorenzo. He's a coastal ocean modeler in EAS. Um, David Frost, he is a uh, infrastructure disaster expert in civil engineering. Uh, Lalith Polipetti, he's a uh, computer scientist and research scientist with the Global Change Program. Tim Cohn is, is director of Seismic for GT Savannah, which is our education and outreach efforts here at Georgia Tech. And Jay McCoval is uh, also a staff at Seismic here at Georgia Tech leading our education efforts, which I'll talk about later. On the Chatham County Emergency Management side, it's led by Randall Matthews. I'm very grateful for his uh, for earliest partnership that we were able to uh, do. There are a couple of cold calls that went very well, I would say. Uh, David Anderson and Dennis Jones, uh, his boss, uh, also providing critical support. 
in the city of Savannah, uh, we have the support of the office of the mayor. This project for that uh, city of Savannah is led by Nick Defley, who is the director of the office of sustainability with key supporting roles by Tom McDonald and David Donnelly, uh, folks who uh, work with uh, floodplains and some of the other city infrastructure that's really relevant to our project. So again, um, without these core partners and um, sustained engagement from Randall and Nick in particular, uh, we would not be where we are today. And I think that it really illustrates the power and impact that the Georgia Smart Communities Framework um, developed in terms of providing transformational um, work and research to these communities across Georgia. So again, we're very proud to be a part of it. So again, the project goals break down into kind of four big buckets. On the first rung, and this is our, our really most important goal, is to provide some help in emergency planning and response. So how can we provide real-time data and uh, do data visualization tools and portals to help visualize and make that data accessible and serve those needs? Second, very important as well, um, how can we, through the data that we're generating and the information that we're uh, delivering on the research side, inform short and long-term risk assessments for uh, resilience planning along the coast? So could we provide some frameworks for assessing pathways to flood risk mitigation um, from a cost-benefit analysis perspective? How can we help the city understand the vulnerability of some of its communities and what they could be doing to improve resilience to coastal flooding events, for example. Um, going down to the educational part, you'll see we're very passionate about that. We've done a lot of work there. Uh, right now, we are working with two uh, schools down in Chatham County. These are public middle school and high school down there and developing some curricula, both in sensor, uh, sensor design and, and, and assembly, as well as sea level rise curricula. And lastly, of course, we're really focused on communication and building awareness around this issue. So uh, obviously that coastal community has had some very near-term brushes in the last several years with hurricanes um, that brings people out and gets people involved in a project like this. And so they see a clear and compelling need and they want to understand what we're trying to do and they want to understand how they can help and they want to be a part of it. So that's been the groundswell of excitement and enthusiasm we felt down there that has also been the lifeblood of this project through um, some public events. Every installation we do um, gets a group of onlookers kind of cheering, cheering them on and uh, wanting to learn more. And our website um, obviously is trying to serve a portion of that need as well. So I'll let Russ take over talking about where we are with the sensor deployment and it's a little bit about the technology because he's really been the, the wizard behind the design and development of what is now a production model sensor uh, and I'll let him take it from here. Thanks, Kim. Uh, and it's, it's certainly a, like everything else about this project. It's a uh, it's a team of wizards. Uh, mm -hmm. Many, many uh, folks have, are contributing to make it successful. Uh, so uh, what what we uh, are, one of the key aspects of the project is to get these uh, water level sensors deployed uh, all around the community, uh, not just uh, as we saw in the, the, uh, the Pulaski tide gauge, not just from one vantage point or one type of waterway, uh, but we wanna see it uh, all over the county. We wanna see different uh, types of waterways uh, from small creeks to thing, uh, waterways that are more focused on rainwater runoff, all the way up to uh, the more nav you know the navigable rivers and and where there are and most importantly where there is critical infrastructure that uh, will can be affected by the rising water. So um, we've uh, developed a, a sensor platform. We'll talk about that the details of that in a little bit more in a second. But uh, you see a picture of the the current uh, production, uh, we'll call it the phase one uh, production prototype. Uh, we've come a long way uh, from five and a half months ago where uh, we were building things out of uh, prototypes out of PVC pipes and uh, uh, looking more, much more conspicuous. But today uh, we uh, are working with this uh, uh, cleaner looking and, and uh, uh, sort of more reliable a easier to install, in, install uh, uh, form factor. Uh, we have uh, eight. We currently have eight uh, sensors installed in in production, where we're getting live data 
Uh, those are uh, highlighted in with the little blue dots on this map, but uh, the idea is that they're spread around the, again, are spread around the county and the city uh, of Savannah and uh, bringing us information uh, uh, from multiple vantage points. Uh, right now, we have a combination of, of uh, bridges uh, as well as docks and, and marinas uh, that are uh, as the basis for that, uh, those installations. And um, uh, you'll see, so the, and then the, the four uh, locations highlighted in yellow are, are currently planned and in, in process installations. Uh, and, and one of the key aspects of that and, and uh, a, a sort of a big development in the last month has been uh, working with uh, uh, the folks, Randall and the folks at, at, at SEMA. We have uh, been able to document, learn about our installation process, refine it, document it, and then work with uh, Georgia DOT to get permission to install, uh, use this technique to do the installation on some of the, the GDOT maintained and uh, controlled bridges. And that's a, that's a big step for us. Uh, it's been an important part of making sure we can cover uh, not only all the way all across the county, but all what, what it turns out to be some of the most critical infrastructure that we can monitor. So a um, uh, really important part of this whole effort has been, you know, growing those partnerships and, and finding ways to move that forward. So um, anyway, so eight sensors uh, installed, uh, four more that we have available. Uh, we really do still uh, plan to ramp up aggressively now. We have 30 more sensors that, will, that are in production today and will be available uh, mid-February and uh, plan to aggressively, now that we have uh, uh, learned a lot and, and sort of figured out the process now that we, we plan to aggressively move forward with installations. Um, and so currently monitoring uh, sea level and air temperature uh, and uh, planned also to, to look at extensions using, looking at, uh, at other properties, uh, both within the water uh, as well as air quality. And then also inland flooding, not just where there's water today, but uh, where there's water perhaps in intersections during a storm event. Um, the technology we're using is uh, based on a new uh, IoT infrastructure called LoRa that requires that we deploy a gateway infrastructure. And so that's part of the project. And um, so a, a part of what we've been learning and, and scoping out with this is, is where to install them and how that installation should take place. This is an example of what's actually an outdoor uh, rated unit, but uh, installed just inside of a window. Um, and the idea is, is that uh, this gives us coverage across uh, a wide area. And while initially we're targeting this as uh, the focus on this, the sea level monitoring application, uh, one of the really nice things from a smart cities perspective overall is that uh, that's just the beginning and that this infrastructure will be useful for, for endless applications uh, in the future. And, and that's part of the, ultimately the benefit of this project. Um, so I'll, I'll finish up the sensor discussion with, um, we did uh, make the decision uh, as part of this project, we evaluated some commercial off the shelf uh, sensors we uh, opted not to go with that for now uh, because uh, of these design requirements that we wanted to make sure we could get the precision we need uh, so that the, and the really the, the validity and the data so that it's useful for the science and some of the modeling that, that Kim's about to talk about, uh, but also meet our goals of, of a long battery life to greatly in, reduce the sort of long-term maintenance cost we don't wanna to have to pay for a truck roll to come touch one of these sensors once it's deployed. Uh, and uh, also very important, keeping the price point. So our material cost for an individual sensor is, is still under $300 uh, and we should be able to, to continue that. And um, that's what a big part of what's gonna allow us to scale this again to that, what, what, what 
may still seem like a, a stretch goal, but but we really do still want to reach uh, as as close to 100 deployed this year as we can. Okay, thanks, Russ. Um, I, I know you guys are as impressed with this technology and, and, and Russ's ability to find places to install that stuff down on the coast as I am. Uh, it's really amazing what he's been able to, to do to develop them and then um, personally installing this stuff down there as well and making all those partnerships, all the permissions. Um, it's, it's probably a, a full-time job in and of itself. So uh, moving on to the modeling framework, I think this is one of the most cutting edge aspects of the project as if the sensor isn't wowing enough. Um, this is a state of the art uh, framework for modeling the coastal ocean uh, it, that will actually incorporate the data that we are generating into a modeling system to provide some forecasting ability. And that's um, one of our key goals. Um, so we, I was just informed that the modeling group has its first ever uh, three-day forecast output. I don't think anyone would want to make any plans on that right now, but um, I'm very excited because this, this model is just something they've been developing over this fall. And so the, the real uh, key observation to make is that um, this data in isolation is just a pocket of sensors, each of which is going to look slightly different from the other. Uh, yes, there's some power in, in equipping emergency planners and responders with some real-time information, but there's a lot more power if we can bring some forecasting still to that, incorporating that network of data streams. And there's real power if we can use that same tool to more comprehensively understand the full range of risk to this community with compound flood risks like a hurricane during high tide, a northeast, northeasterly wind event during high tide, um, you know, a heavy rain event and a wind event. Uh, the list can go on and on, I think, as you can tell, translating a weather scale model, basically, into a flood risk framework that integrates the information from the open ocean conditions all the way up through the county to dry land. And so this sounds, you know, really hard. It is really hard because you have to combine components of the models uh, from the ocean that circulates and changes uh, fresh water across its boundary and heat flux and moves around, uh, does tides. And then you have the land model that captures rainwater, for example, and channels it down uh, to the coast. Uh, you have uh, urban infrastructure and green infrastructure in there, and you have an atmosphere uh, blowing winds and rains down upon you as well. And so you need an atmosphere, land, ocean model, and you'd ideally like all of that infrastructure to be part of it. So that is our goal. And we're trying to model from the open ocean to the urban scale. And this is led by Monty Di Lorenzo in Earth Atmospheric Sciences, who is uh, one of the world's experts on high resolution coastal ocean modeling. And he's leading up a team in partnership with the University of Bologna. So this is officially an international project. We have an MOU with them. They are also one of the world's leading experts on um, high resolution coastal models and are doing some of the forefront work on integrating them into urban systems. As you may know, Venice has a tiny problem with flooding as well. So um, here's the, just the grid to give you a sense of the richness, the complexity, and the computing power that we need to run this grid at this resolution. So this is currently a 10 meter grid. It adapts to the coastline, as you can see. It's not a bunch of squares piled up there. They're actually triangles that get bigger and smaller as you approach the coastline. Those triangle grids go all the way up, snaking into those tributaries, able to simulate runoff, and its interaction with the tide is one of our first steps. Going forward, of course, we want to incorporate full atmosphere model and hydrology where we can get acute extreme rainfall events um, and simulate those is, is integrating with the ocean. We need that land model, as I said, and the infrastructure piece will be critical. And David Frost is and Iris Twen in, in Civil are really a component of that, um, that work. And so this is just one of the simulations that um, the team shared with us uh, earlier in the project. And so this is, I think, a six hourly step through a, just a tidal cycle, sea level on the coast there. And so the key points here is that um, you know, we, can all, we can use this to do a, a real-time forecast, um, and we can also use this to uh, project flood risk going forward under a large variety of scenarios, including different global sea level scenarios, 
different weather event um, extremes, et cetera. So we're very excited for the development of this tool. And so this is just one of the early outputs trying to ground truth the model output tidal cycle at Fort Pulaski, which is our observational gauge um, of note. And we have the observations in black and the model in red. And it's doing just an amazing job, pretty much, it, it's simulating this tidal cycle. So this is just the first ever simulation they did. Um, but I think it's, it's very promising and, and bodes pretty well. Where we see departures from this, we could anticipate that that might be due to some little local weather related events and some spatial, um, some spatial complexity that the model's not yet capturing. So these are the kinds of things we'd like to nail going forward and not just benchmarking against Fort Pulaski, but benchmarking against the dozens of sensors that we'll have in the water across the entire domain, which stretches across the entire county. So, Yes, uh, it's ambitious, but we are at the point in the ocean sciences, the hydrology community, the weather community, where we can start to put these pieces together. And I believe this will be one of the first fully integrated uh, coastal ocean land atmosphere models out there. So I'm very honored to be working with this team of experts. So uh, moving on to the educational partnerships, just touching on them briefly, I know that um, uh, some people may be more interested in those than others. Please reach out and get in touch. But we have operations uh, currently going on with Jenkins High School and a great partnership. Those are the teachers there um, posed with some of the um, Georgia Tech team. And they are uh, actually going to be seeing some sensors and seeing the project team on Monday morning <laughs> in uh, three days or four days. Bright and early at 7.30 in the morning. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to join us? You could join us, 7.30 down on the coast at Jenkins High School. Um, so they'll be hearing about the project. They'll be launching uh, kind of a sensor assembly project for those engineering students there. And so it's something we've been working on for a while. We're excited to uh, finally get that going with the students. At Oglethorpe Middle School, we are going to be working through the development of a new sea level rise curriculum with the sensor data and sensor technology embedded in it. So the idea is that the students who live down on the coast and understand these problems uh, from the news and from the evacuation orders and from the threats uh, that they know they lived through can actually get the background information about what determines uh, flood risk and, and what can we do about it as a community and, and how can we uh, be agents for helping our communities be more resilient and, and to this issue and more aware. So we're very excited about that. And Jayma Koval, who's the center uh, um, woman right there, she is leading that effort at the middle school and she has a C grant from the um, Climate Fellows Program to develop that curriculum. So that's gonna be going forward this spring as well. Of the, um, uh, if I might add, of the, uh, I mentioned the 30 sensors that are under on production. Uh, of that, 20 of those are, are actually destined for Jenkins High School in a couple of weeks where we're going to bring them the components and the students are actually going to do the final assembly, integration and testing. Uh, and as you know, you can't get a better community engagement where <laughs> the students are going to build the sensor that's going to go on the bridge that they're going to drive by uh, and be able to talk about, hey, I built that uh let's go let's let's go look at the data and 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 find out what it's telling us <laughs> super fun i would love to be one of those high school students honestly <laughs> so uh, i know they're excited we're, we're terribly excited obviously about um these two these two core partnerships and i think that once we develop the ideas once we develop these kinds of experiential learning opportunities and the framework for engaging with the project the curriculum around this um, stuff we can obviously get this out into other middle schools and high schools in the area because I think that the appetite and the need is there. Um, we just need to make it work with some of these very early key partners. Um, we're excited. Okay, so moving on to community engagement, uh, just one of my last slides here. Um, we were just at Russ and I, an event on Tuesday down in Brunswick, Georgia, which is in Glynn County, neighboring Glynn County. And this is a panel of experts, it includes a banker. Well, I don't know if he's an expert. He's an expert on flood insurance, that's for sure. Um, uh, all the way to the uh, Department of Natural Resource experts there. Um, and holding the microphone is Jill Gamble from UGA. She's done resilience planning for Tybee Island and St. Mary's. And then Russ and I on the far left, 
uh, talking about the sea level sensor project and the audience was full <laughs> there were well over 200 people in the room that day uh, wanting to hear from these experts about the long-term risk they're really focused on how are our communities going to grapple with this new reality and uh, how can we prepare and so uh, just just a amazing conversation. I might go so far as to call it a historic conversation for that county, certainly the first of many conversations that we know will be taking place. I know I was honored to be a part of it. I know Russ was as well, and we were eager to hear from some members of those communities about how the Sea Level Sensor Project might serve these communities going forward. Right now, we're very focused on Chatham, uh, but obviously there's an appetite up and down the coast, as I said before. And the other neat thing about this project is the deep dives we've been doing with some key stakeholders, uh, not just on the coast, but across the state and even some cases beyond our state. So talking with folks in Charleston, uh, the National Weather Service, uh, Skidaway Institute of Oceanography, uh, Savannah College of Art and Design, talking with them about some of our uh, goals for our public installation of some aspects of the project. And Tybee Island Marine Science Center that we'll be visiting on Monday. Um, so they see thousands of school children every year. So, you know, this is a way that our project could have impact far beyond the scope of our now, uh, what our goals now are, and going forward, uh, touch the lives of many people across Georgia, not just on the coast. So this has been one of the other benefits to learn continually about uh, how we could partner better and how we could serve um, multiple end uses while we go forward. And so just wrapping up, um, we're obviously very, very busy, kind of all cylinders firing. We have a workshop. Uh, you're welcome to join the live stream of that on January 29th from about 9 to 10.30. Uh, it's when our project team gets together every two or three months, and we uh, do a deep dive through our portfolios. We update each other on all these different working groups, and we plot our next steps. And the public overview is a great time to learn about these other aspects in more detail I've touched on today, as well as engage in a pretty extensive Q&A and I can tell you that those Q&As, and I, I'm sure this one will be too, are extremely informative for the project. We identify new partners every time we have one of those events. So please join us. You can also go to the website and down at the very bottom, there's a space to sign up for our newsletter where you can keep track of some of the, the, uh, the progress that we're making and get maps of sensors and, mm -hmm. and keep up with things. And then of course, I invite you, if you're, uh, whether you're an expert, a practitioner or a student, uh, get involved. There's actually room for everybody. We're working with Georgia Tech undergrads in this project. Uh, we, we didn't talk about that, but that, that's worth a special mention today, especially given that there may be some students listening. Um, we're actually working with some junior design students in, in computer science who are working with the data streams to help us design portals. So this is um, a web portal to visualize the data for the public, as well as some really cool forward thinking ideas um, in terms of turning this data into apps or turning the whole sea level problem into experience uh, on your computer, your phone that uh, really uses the data, but it provides a context for it in a way that it really enhances um, the engagement, the fun, and of course the learning. And in this regard, I really want to make a special call out to Lalith Polipetti, who's been um, really leading those undergraduate teams of computer science um, uh, students so that we can uh, develop some prototypes over this first year of the project even and get some students intimately engaged with it. And the student appetite is very clear. They, they really want to get involved. So if you're a student out there, please reach out whether you're an undergraduate or a graduate. Plenty of room. Again, you know, we're, we're looking about health all the way to ocean modeling, risk resilience, equity issues. Um, these are some of the many things that uh, we, we hope to touch on in this, even in this first year of work. So I'll just close with a, a thanks to all the project team, to the Georgia Smart Communities folks for the brilliant idea of launching this whole initiative and providing a framework for us to work together. And this, this core question that uh, our team always asks of, of our partners down there, you know, how can we best serve these communities? Thank you. Thank you so much, Kim, Russ. We have a, a couple of questions that have come in uh, off the chat area, but again, if you do have questions for, for these two professors in this topic, please uh, ask them now in the, in the chat area. We're happy to answer them here. Um, Kim, I've got a couple okay, of questions all right. here if you want to. Okay, so starting with uh, the first one here, as a concerned coastal resident, what can I do to help make an impact? 
So uh, I wish I knew how you want to make an impact, <laughs> what you consider impact. Um, I'm thinking that you might be concerned about um, your elected officials being aware of this. Um, maybe you're interested in getting your communities moving on this issue. Um, I think that the forum that I, I alluded to on Tuesday was a really rich resource of information. So I would point you to the Coastal Georgia Foundation. What was the umbrella for that, um, Russ? Do you remember? Um, no, but we can let me look it up while we're. Okay, well, I, I will say that that had a, uh, collected all the presentations from all the speakers. And again, you're talking about um, planners, bankers, civil engineers scientists and engineers, um, giving that community our best. And so uh, also the Q&A touched on some of these issues about what can I do? And I thought that was very impactful. That whole event was recorded. So that's really a community focused event that I would, I would point you to. And Russ is gonna get me that information in a minute. So in the interest of time, I'll just move on to the next one and come back to that once Russ has that. Um, what is the current estimate for the density of sensors placed through the community that will allow for robust modeling Part A, we'll come to Part B in a second. So that's a really good question. That's actually something that we can test with the modeling framework itself. So we can go in and put observational sensors, obviously we're not doing this on the ground, this is putting them in the model and asking them what they're learning. Are they learning new and critical information? Or are they too duplicative of their neighbors? So it's important to say that we'd love to have a lot of redundancy baked into the system because some of the sensors um, you know, may fail and we may need that critical information. But in fact, to answer your question, one of the powerful things about using the modeling framework is we will get that answer through querying the model itself. And so we look forward to getting some information. Right now, of course, we have a pretty low density of sensors across the county. We know it's not nearly enough, um, but um, I think definitely as we build out towards 100, we're going to reach that point where we say, probably, is this enough? And that's when we can turn to the model Hopefully we'll be ready by then and provide that information about maybe there's some key places we're missing that the model wants us to put a sensor on. And that's gonna help in the design of future extension of these networks up and down the coast. We'll be able to look at the model and say, where does the model want us to put those? And what have we learned on the ground about the data streams coming in so far? And of course we can compare the data in the model to see how well the model's doing, um, et cetera. Part B of that was, will you reach it with a hundred sensors or will it take more like a thousand? I don't think it's gonna take a thousand by any stretch. Um, I think we chose a hundred as kind of an expert pool of folks because in talking with the ocean modelers and their intuition about this specific geography, we felt like a hundred was a good, really good start, more than meaningful, a lot of information for us to work with, but I don't think it's anywhere near a thousand. Okay, other, oh, you wanna share the information, Russ, that you dug up about that, um, the PowerPoints and presentations? Yes, so the uh, presentations from uh, Tuesday uh, are available on the, uh, it's the Coastal Georgia Foundation, and their website is all one word, coastalgeorgiafoundation.org, and there's a event section there where uh, there's links to it. It doesn't look like the video is up quite yet, but uh, the notes well, from it are there, and so yeah, that's coastalgeorgiafoundation.org. Great. Well, thank you so much, Kim, Russ. This was very informative. Everyone, if you do have additional questions, uh, we're happy to answer them. You can you can send them to uh, SCII at ipad.gotech.edu. Uh, you can also visit uh, Kim and Russ's website specifically for uh, this effort, the sea level sensors .org. Are we out of time? Or uh, we're not quite out of time. We have a couple more minutes. Um, if there are additional questions or if there are other topics that you want to talk about, um, if not, then, we then we, the we'll close it. Uh, it doesn't look like any additional I questions came in. Coming in okay. the chat. All right. So I think that's that. That's a wrap. So again, thank you every, everyone for attending, and we hope you come back for our next two webinars as part of the series. Uh, the next one up will be March seventh. That will be Professor Angshman Gwen. We'll be talking about connected vehicle technology and traffic congestion as part of the Gwinnett County. Georgia Smart Communities Challenge Project. And then our last webinar will be on May 9th with Professor Omar Asensio. He'll be talking about public policy and smart technology and how the city of Albany is using data to open government, specifically in the areas of housing and equity. So again, thank you so much. Thank you, Professor 
uh, Kim Cobb and Professor Russ Clark. Everyone have a great day. Bye.